<lacht> Hallo, Freunde des Lichts und des Ruhms. Äh, willkommen äh, hier. Was ist denn hier los? Hallo? Ähm, auf Lasergurkenland, dem gratis erreichbaren Minecraft-Server. Äh, immer neueste Vanilla-Version ohne Regeln. Hier könnt ihr eure Freiheit ausleben und eure perversen Fantasien zur Wahrheit werden lassen. Ähm, ja, genau. IP von Lasergurkenland ist 149.202.127.134. Und wir hören heute rein in... Oh, ich hätte meinen Soundtest noch vorher machen sollen. Hey, hey. Äh, Defcon24 von Lost. Hacker Fundamentals and Cutting Through Abstraction. 2016. Hallo. Okay. Everybody's got their own conversation going on. Cool. I guess you're not really wanting to pay attention to what the badge means or any of the good, wonderful... Ja, ich denke, ich hoffe mal, ihr hört was. Together. 
But anyway, one of my pet peeves is this idea that um, as hackers, you have to be creative. And in order to be creative, you have to think outside the box. And how many of you have heard the term, think outside the box? Raise your hand. How many of you know what the origin of that term is? Where does that come from? Besides the obvious impose, you have a set of mental heuristics that you're imposing upon this problem, and you carry those with you, and if some high and mighty guy came down from off the, off the mountaintop and said, thou shalt not impose this particular uh, heuristic, then all of a sudden, magically, you're going to be creative and go, aha, Eureka, and you're going to solve the next what? major problem. So there have been studies that have shown that that's total bullshit. The, uh, the original origin of that uh, term is from the nine dot problem, which is a puzzle where you draw nine dots in a box, three, three, three. And they say, connect all the dots without lifting the pen. How many lines can you do it in? And of course, at, or and sometimes you'll have a constraint, you can't cross the line as much as you can. This depends on the variant. And of course, invariably, people have imposed this mental box because it's in a square. And so it's really, really difficult. And then some jackass comes up and is all clever and he's like, oh, I go outside what that frame was, yada, yada, yada. Well, it's been studied and it's been shown that even if you take a group of people and you tell them from the start, you have to draw outside of this composed square, that the same percentages of people solve the problem or can't solve the problem. And the way you get people to have those epiphanal aha creative moments is to deep study in a particular subject area. Now, as we go further and further with technology, Google, search engine, instant gratification, phone in your pocket, I don't have to go through any of the mental labor to get any of the answers or questions that I have anymore. We, we do certain things faster, but we've lost a sense of wisdom and our knowledge. And by doing so, we're starting to shortchange ourselves. And we're going to start to lose the, in, the epiphanal genius moments that come from that deep study of the subject area. So when I do my cryptographic puzzle challenges, I structure them to do three things. I want you guys to talk to each other. I intentionally put things on the lanyards every year so that you have to find other people and you have to interact with them. Not only that, but there's stuff even on the back too. You have to take it off. You have to linger from the other person. It forces at least a, a time for you to interact with one of those other people. And for a crowd that is predominantly introverts, you know, I'm trying to force you to talk to each other. Yeah. You know, the whole joke about you can tell who the, who the, uh, the extrovert at like, the Duck Hunt Comics is he's a guy looking at someone else's shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so that, that's my soapbox for that. During the one-on-one -on -one talks, I have a tradition also of saying, I'm not going to explain, and obviously in a 40-minute talk, 50 minutes, I don't even know how long I'm supposed to be up here. But in a talk, I'm not going to be able to teach you or thank you or give you um, deep knowledge in a subject. What I'm hoping to give you are hooks. I'm hoping to give you hooks to give you the right points to start to go down. And by the way, I mean dope mo. I do not mean to show disrespect to anybody. I know a lot of you have deep knowledge in a lot of these subject areas, but I kind of shotgun it to try and give people a foundational knowledge of these are the things that I think if you kind of generally know about, you can have a well-informed conversation with someone in a place like that. Cool? Do you understand where I'm coming from? Yes, no? Yeah. You awake? Yeah. I'm tired too. <laughs> well, what do you think of the bathroom here, by the way? So because this is 101, we don't tell DC I'm not tell you. I don't know if they'll say I'm just trying to make a secret or not. I'm going to tell you guys because you're 101 and you can do hard for There, There were Let's just say, I can't tell you quantity, but there were thousands of badges that were ordered. How many of you have ever done uh, my uh, production of electronics of any kind? Okay, how many of you understand how long it takes to do not only the pick place, but how long it takes to program firmware onto something? Every single one of the badges that you have, or I do that right now, were programmed within the space of the last three days. And, I, and, and that's why I say none of this would happen without the community. So that was me. I was a boss jackass with a, with a programmer. That was hundreds and hundreds of volunteers who weren't paid, who are people that come to the pond that are here early, that we run up and down the halls going, we have an emergency, guess what? Bad to show up, and they weren't programmed before they got to us. 
is to reset up a chop shop in Midtown. And, and, and there are people, there are people in this room right now who have been awake literally for four days. Some of them are in the front row right now. Okay, pet peeve number two. I get really frustrated with people, first of all, if you don't understand or know something, admit it. I don't know lots of stuff. When I talk to people at DEF CON, there's really, really smart people around here, you guys. And when I have conversations with you after I do conference talks like this, people come up and I'll talk about stuff, and they'll say something like, oh, I don't know what that is. Tell me, explain that to me. Um, my grandfather used to talk about Colombo. I mean, uh, the younger people in the audience were like, who the hell is that? Google it. Um, so, so Colombo is a fictional character who is like the, <coughs> excuse me, the ultimate social engineer. He used to get everyone he met to teach him something, even if he knew it already, because it disarmed him. So social engineering tip 101 right there. But I, I try and, and not have, you know, when I first came back on, I was scared of crap, but I was like, these guys are way smart, they're gonna say stuff I don't understand, and they're gonna turn an idiot, they're gonna kick me out, I, I didn't know what was going on. And if you can just be confident enough to talk with people, you kind of know what that is. And on the flip side, don't be an arrogant ass, but if you know something, Share it with other people. Because that's the only way this community is going to get better. For example, how many of you are aware with the discussions that are going on with cryptography and back to arm? Yes, no, the politics involved with what's going on? That's going to fundamentally change communication. And with people like us, the folks at the DEF CON conference, we need to talk about stuff like that. Because otherwise, stuff's going to go and the genie won't be able to put it back in the bottle after certain events. So I'm not going to push my policy on you. So let's just say we need to share the knowledge and information so that we can all elevate and it's not select. So. Okay. I get really tired when I talk to people and they make the statement, I know that a computer uses binary. I know that a computer speaks binary. Oh, that is like it's like a cheese grater on my thigh. I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So and I often will ask people, do you know what that really means? Do you understand that? Now I know that there's a lot of people in the science who are like, all I do is code. I don't give a shit about process rules. I hate that attitude. How can you think like that? Remember the discussion we just had about creative epiphanal moments? A lot of times those epiphanal moments become from tangential information that may be related to the subject but not directly involved. Because if it's directly involved, some jack has to already thought of it. How many of you know about the original Bell Labs? or heard of it. And if you have it, especially young folks, go look it up. Because it's like my dream mecca. Like if I could go anywhere in a time machine, I could go back in time to the original Bell Labs. The reason the original Bell Labs was by the way you have C because of the original Bell Labs. You have a lot of things that you usually really like because of the original Bell Labs. What it was is a collection of experts in different areas, but they weren't so fucked. It wasn't like here's the math department, here's the physics department, here's the electronics guys. They were like the chemist who was next door to the computer guy who was next door to the mathematician next door to the linguist. They all had access to each other. And that's what caused this, the genesis of all of this great creativity. And we started losing that because everybody wants to keep everything secret, they don't want to share, and, and so we lose those particular interconnections. So, back to the, I know how a process works. If you come to me and say, uh, Ryan, you, you wasted my time at that point, I don't care how a process works, I just want to code. I would say to you, you do not have the mindset of a hacker, and I don't want to talk to you. So. <laughs> I mean, like, I go back to that comment I said about subscribing to magazines. I subscribed to, like, a sewing magazine for a year. You know, just, and I actually learned really cool stuff. So, here's one of the experiments we're going to do today. You guys are all coming along with me on this ride. This one's going to be fun. So, uh, uh, can I have a couple of you, or however many you want, and then you all got cell phones in your pockets to have timers on. Like a stopwatch. Good. I'm not going to lie, I did not practice this part because I was like, this. Balls to the wall, let's go. Let's see if we can do this. Call your phone. So in a second, we're going to synchronize and we're going to start. And I'm going to try in 10 minutes to talk through going from the three basic fundamental logic cases to a functioning processor. In 10 minutes. How many of you have had digital logic uh, and, uh, classes and things like that? How many of you could sit down and actually describe that process to somebody? How many of you have time to remember? 
Okay, how many of you are students right now? Everybody should raise their hand by this trick question. Okay, so are you ready? So I need to some water and we're gonna go. And the reason I'm only doing it in 10 minutes now is if you guys, if this is a total failure, we only wait for 10 minutes and you can kind of <laughs> you can kind of forgive me for that. So what this is not, this is not me teaching you all this information. This is me running through the forest wildly like my hair is on fire, screaming out the things that you should Google or look up, that you would then be able to have the knowledge of what these things are. And if one or two things sounds interesting to you, hook on to that and go down that path. So again, one on one talks, nobody's gonna be able to give you a deep dive in a 40 minute talk. Are you ready? Okay, so at like three minutes for somebody, somebody be like, hold your finger, three. Don't be like, I just do it every minute. Like one, two, because I kind of got a feel for how to do this. And I have to talk really fast. Okay, here we go. I have a little process in 10 minutes. No pressure. All right, ready, set, start the thing. Okay, so we got this guy, his name is Bert Wool. He's cool, he comes up with this type of logic um, where he talks about these three fundamental logic cases. Um, and, or, and not, I mean, you've heard of that, raise your hand. Yes, you all heard of it, okay? <laughs> so, if I take a piece of wire, okay, and I cut it here and here, I have just created a logic case, it's called and, why? Because if I connect the wire here but not here, the electricity doesn't flow. If I connect it here and not here, electricity doesn't flow. If I have two cuts and I took them both down, this and this, electricity flows through. So I can make an AND gate in the wire. So we have the first fundamental logic gate. Or I can take the same wire and I can run it in parallel. And I can cut one or cut the other, and if I connect one of them, electricity is still going to flow. So if the top one or the bottom one go, we'll have electricity. Or not. <laughs> Okay, can't laugh, we're gonna take our time. <laughs> not is gonna basically invert the signal. We won't talk about how we do that, let's just say that you can do electronics if you're interested in that, think about that. How does that happen? Google it. <laughs> the first fundamental piece I'm gonna fill. So we have three fundamental building blocks. We have and, or, and we have not. I claim that if you connect them in this particular configuration, I will have this thing that I am going to call an adder. But this is a half adder because there is not a thing which people call a carry in. This takes two bits of information, one and two. And if they are both one out the ass in comes a zero and a one which is carried. If that doesn't make sense to you, Google it. Look up half out of it. It's on Wikipedia. The important part to take away is two bits of information in, one bit of information out, and a carry bit out. So two in, two out. Boom. So we got a count. How do I make a counter? Quick question. Uh, I'm running the time to get you nervous. So we're gonna take, we're gonna take that half batter and I'm gonna shove it inside a box. And this is called the scratch key. We do this a lot. We do everything we do. Everyone does OOP programming and all these other things. I need to take circuits, shove it into a box because we're gonna grow complexity. So everybody comfortable with that. That box represents two things coming in, one thing coming out with the carrot. Yes? Go. Incrementally better. I'm gonna stack these things. I'm gonna take one, I'm gonna put it on top of the other. Now I claim I can have two bits of information coming in and two bits of information coming out with the carrot. Everybody cool? And if you don't understand that, look up half outer and stack it. So that brings us to an important point. I said two bits in, two bits out. So we have to use this thing we call hex to represent the numbers. If you're not familiar with why we use hex, I would challenge you to take a bunch of switches from Home Depot home with you tonight and take the first switch and sit and look at it and say, how many things can I represent with a single switch? On and off, two, binary. That's why a computer uses binary. But I just said these tests, not binary. Why is that? Because on standard systems, when we first started, it didn't make sense to take a whole lot of a single bit, so we added a bunch of bits together. We basically standard this, so if I take one switch, I get two things. If I take two switches, I get how many things? Four. If I take three switches, I get how many? Raw. If I take four switches, 16. So we need at least four to represent decimal, which is our natural tendency to count because we've got 10 of these things, right? So we have to go up to four bits. But if we only go to 10, but we use four bits, we wasted some because you just told me we could go up to 16. We don't want to waste those. We want to be efficient. So we use a different representation, our number base, also called the radius. Look it up. And that number base is base 16, also called hex. By the way, on a side note, there is a number number base or radius called hexamol, 
which is phase six, which is why I believe a pirate would come in because he has five fingers and a hook. <laughs> so, a bit negative. Okay, you just told me the computer only has one zero inside. How do I deal with negative numbers? Shit, I don't know how to have the minus sign. Oh shit, we're at four minutes. Let's go. So, I need to have a clever, tricky way of reassigning what numbers mean in binary so that I can have negative. There's a cool thing called one complement. Well, that kind of sucks because things didn't line up right. Look up one complement, then look up two complement because we said I can take one complement and I can fix it so that we can do this cool thing by having negative numbers so that test each other out and react together, and that's where two complement comes from. And I claim that this circuit here will give you two complement representation of a number. Look up. There's these things called stop and pop. Everybody hates them pop, so we're gonna skip it. Get off your half letter. I claim this half letter because we didn't have to carry in. So we want to fix that. I would claim that the logic of a carrot is A and B and together. If A and B are both one, then I'm going to get a carrot. Full adder is what I get from that. We're going to shove that into a box because we're going to extract and go further because how many comments time we have left? Five minutes. Fully stacked. Now I'm going to take my full adder. I'm going to stack them together. This is representation of a 2-bit. I will leave it as an exercise to the reader to extend it to 4-bits so we can do our 4-bit microprocessor. Guess what? It looks exactly the same. Keep that. So, full. If you have four full adders in a box, put them together, you get what is known as a 4-bit adder. You have to carry in. You have a 4-bit number on the top, 4-bit number on the bottom, and off the other end comes the answer. Let's carry. Let's go. What is three one? Okay. We can now Represent numbers kind of inside. But I got to steer stuff around instead of processing it. So how am I going to do that? I have to have a way of steering stuff around. We have these things called locks. Many come in, one comes out, I have a way to choose it. So this is kind of like traffic pop inside. I also have to have the opposite. I have to have one come in and I can drive to the other places. With these two things called a MOS and a DMOS, I can steer anything anywhere I want to go inside the processor. Cool? If you understand it, do it. Stack the deck. If I take two muscles and put them together, I am building six minutes. Okay, here we go. Stack the deck. Two muscles put together, out the other end, I can control where data goes. You all get the point. We're controlling the flow of information inside the process. By the way, why does it matter? We're first going to get this register, and it doesn't matter when we start doing code, when we start programming in assembly, what you're going to do is you're going to write shell code. So shut up if you don't want to hear it. <laughs> Just kidding. So, logic. Inside the processor, in order not to be a calculator, you have to have logic, right? We have to be able to do logical functions on the data we put in, or we have to be able to do arithmetic. So, we have this thing called ALU. That's from the TV show B. ALU is like a three if you look at it. Those of you who get the joke, if not, you it. <laughs> so, you take all of this stuff, you shove it in, the one's complement, the two's complement, you put it in, and we are going to create this thing we call an egg not circuit. The egg not circuit says, I have data coming in or coming out. And with those two control lines down there, I can either choose to negate it or if not it. So I have the ability to do a function, so let's go. And or, with no pass through. Information comes in without the asking, with the control here. This is all the direction that we just built up to. I can take data in, as it comes out, I can choose to do an add or for it. So I have math and logic and not trace. So this is with the pass. All I did was take a muscle in, which I talked about before. I want the data to either be processed on or not processed on. That's what the muscle is for. That's the pass line is for. Let's go. So, let's think about the box with the and or check. ALU, there it is. It is all in the story. That is basically the essence of what you can have inside the processor at home. Now, here's the play. There's a cool thing called propagation play, which we now don't have time to talk about because we're in a hurry. So, look it up. Basically, it says, okay, it takes the amount of time to go through all this crap and come out the asset. Now what? We have the ALU. I need to be able to produce input and store it. And then I'll have my full function computer. So I have to have these things called decoders. We set up the same thing as the US. Well, shit. Why didn't you call it that in the first place? So I can decode my decoders and decode the decoders of the decoders, in which case I can grow the address space and I can go from 4 bits to 8 bits, 16 bits, etc. Basically, this is just that decoders. So I have flip flops, flip flops, the really cool things that are latches inside the old information so I can now have not just a state machine, but I can hold stuff over time. Figure logic, combinational, or sequential. We're going to talk about sequential, so that's what computers are because they have to have memory, so we're not just based on the here now or the state. 
So, if we delete things called registers, which are in flip flop, which should come in, so we have the thing that all the information, those registers are what you see when you open up, like, either pro. You can see register, whatever. That's the this. Okay, so that's the general structure. We're going to get to this really quickly. How much time? Oh, brain. This is the brain of the microprocessor. You've got ALU, you've got your memory, which we just assigned. Control coming in, you notice control has nothing there. Shit, this is the brain of the microprocessor. We need the brain one. So how do I do that? I take that. I've got buffers on the side. That's the data of the program. I've got a thing called a decoder, which takes my instructions. But I don't know how to control. See how the switch in the middle? So I did a thing called RAM. Uh, you need to go from the one on the top, where the control manager blank, to the one on the bottom, where we'll have everything done. PC address generation. PC is called for program counter. You have to give a step to the test of the program. We saw we could do an incrementer for an address. We got that piece. Get up the box. You have a thing called ROM, which basically defines all the control fields for what I want the thing to actually do. I put them all together, and that's your full time. Ich kam mir länger vor als 10 Minuten, to be honest. Da geht's ja ab. I done. Okay, those of you 
you can or can't, you know, I'm going to sit with my laptop unless you're doing CCF or you're doing my challenge, but this is the best part about my challenge. CCF, you know, you're going to sit in isolation with your team with your head down your laptop and you're going to talk to them. You're in my challenge, you're going to talk to other people. You don't have a choice. So it's all about people to me. By the way, I had just more than curiosity. How do the uh, teleprompter people deal with that? That monstrosity you just went to. Awesome. Awesome. So how do they deal with uh, foreign language? Are you kidding? Yes. I'm not a first time speaker. Okay, 
So I did a, I did a public badge for a conference called the Gathering for Gardner. How many of you know who Martin Gardner is? If you don't know who Martin Gardner is, he is the father of what we call recreational mathematics. He's also like the champ he used to write for Scientific American doing the puzzle stuff. And most of you who've done puzzly type stuff like in the newspaper or magazine, he probably influenced that somehow. He's a pioneer. I've got much respect to Martin who is no longer with us. Um, at that conference, basically, I found we had two camps of people. We had mathematicians and we had professional magicians, which is a really interesting mix. And I met this guy who looked at me and was introducing himself, and apparently, uh, how many of you know what XKCD is? Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> so XKCD had written a comic strip about the school that this guy wrote. And he came up to me and he, he had heard that I was like this puzzle guy. He was like a puzzle guy. He goes, I made this thing, and it got a lot of press because XKCD featured it on his like his website got all the time. He goes, you know what he is? He said, you know what? I'm going to use it. I'm going to use a desk pump. I'm going to give you credit for it. I'm going to make sure people write you. So there is this tool, and I have a challenge for people at this conference. Find the XKCD comic, the tool, and the name of the author before the end of that time, and come to the 1057 room and tell that information to me, and I will have some for you. So that is me giving kind of like a mini challenge to the folks that don't want to get hard for the competition. It should take you very much time with Google to define. But in his algorithm, he is able to put in a number and generate functions and equations that produce that number. Now you're saying yourself, oh, this is past day, this is easy, I've lost the processing power now, I will just do an exhaustive search. Bullshit. If any of you understand how complexity grows, that is not what this guy is doing. And this algorithm is doing. And I bring it up for a reason. Because I'm convinced that someone out here that's been hearing what I'm saying right now is going to look at that and is going to get inspired in a way to use that algorithm. I have an intuitive feel that that particular algorithm is applicable to some other aspect of what we do as hackers, but I haven't quite put my thumb on that. And if one of you finds it, just give me a nod or something. I don't care. But I really believe somebody out there is working on a problem, or working on an exploit, or working on something in security, that this particular uh, algorithm would be useful for. I don't know what it is, but I'm throwing that challenge out there. You remember I, I said this in a team report, so when some guy moves the Nobel Prize and does something amazing, I get I helped make that happen, and that's what this is really all about. Okay, I am about dead on my feet. This is what I have for you guys for 101. I want to know if you guys have any questions for me. Okay, I prefer to talk. You guys are new to that one. Ask me anything you want. Like, hey, I'm new to that one. Yeah. What type of IT on the design? He's asking what type of chip on that? You know. What is it? It's, it's an Intel Core D2000. What does that mean? It means it's x86 compatible. Ooh. Yeah. Any other questions, questions before I fall over and we set up the panel? No? No, no question. Really? No, no question? Give me part one. Like, why do you wear those shoes? Why are you wearing lots of I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. You mean like this? Oh, the lanyards? So, so, so I have a question, question for you. Why would I make a different, different lanyards than just give it all out in the picture? Oh, meat space DDoS. DDoS. This is meat space. Oh, after the after the fact. So generally, people that compete in my competition tend to write up descriptions of what they had to do to solve the problem. And I guarantee you somebody will have done that. So it, this is confession. Sorry, guys. I usually count on them doing that, but I don't have to. <laughs> I really want to thank you guys for coming out. I hope you, yeah, yeah, go. Okay, so I'll save the panel. We'll, we'll, uh, I'll save the panel. Thank you guys for coming. Oh, and these are awesome gunner glasses that I love. So thank you guys for coming. Okay, ja, das war's dann auch. Um mit dieser Episode, das war der Talk von 
Um, here with Bescheid von Lost Hacker Fundamentals and Cutting Through Abstraction. Wir sehen uns dann in der nächsten Folge wieder. Tschüssi.